Turn in your Bibles to John 13, John chapter 13. We're in the last night, and if you need a Bible, lift your hand. We have one we can give to you, and you can follow along. Um, we're in the last night of Jesus' life on earth. It's this Thursday night, approximately 24 to 36 hours or that before um, he goes um, and dies on the cross. And there's all kinds of things about Jewish the time, Jewish um, time. Basically, the Jews believe in, in, in the Jewish calendar, um, they, their morning is 6 o'clock in the evening, and their evening is 6 in the morning. So it's different from ours. So there's different ways to look at it, but we are in the last night of Jesus' life on earth. This, from chapter 13 to 17, will be called the Upper Room Discourse. And prior to some of his teaching, what we're going to see is he's going to institute the Lord's Supper, and he gives a little bit of information, it's more, a, lot of, a lot of it's in the other Gospels, and he's going, to, um, uh, he's going to wash the disciples' feet during his time. Now, Jesus gives four discourses in the Bible. Um, Basically, here they're like this in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. It's the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew chapter 13, it's the kingdom parables. In um, Matthew 24, and it's also in Mark 13 and 21, but Matthew 24 is the famous one. It's the Olivet Discourse, where Jesus teaches all about the end times, okay? And then there's this one, the Upper Room Discourse from actually chapter 13, to um, 17. This is probably the longest. I know that it would seem like maybe the um, Sermon on the Mount's long, and it is, but this, this is such detail on the discourse here. And so they say that John gives so much detail in this last night and these teachings that Jesus gave that could fill 15 Bibles that thick. You know, those real thick honking Bibles. So I don't know how they come up with that. All I know is that if in, in Jesus' teaching, he taught so much, did so much ministry that the Bible even says, John says, the books couldn't, in the world couldn't hold it. Now, again, during this time where we're seeing the Lord's Supper is instituted, and we see there's foot washing, which is not an ordinance in the church. It's just a custom that they did in those days, that Jesus took a custom that they did in those days, and, did, and he taught through their culture, uh, about about that custom. Now during uh, but during supper, Judas was planning, and it, we we see that Judas was planning to to have Jesus and b betray him. He had already walked into that night before that, knowing that he was going to betray him. The devil put it in his heart. The Bible says. So right before the last supper, I don't know where this fit. Somewhere maybe during the supper, or before the supper, but. The guys began to, and I, th I think it was somewhere after the supper, the guys began to argue who was the greatest. Like, I mean, Jesus is going to go to the cross. He's going to die for our sins. He's opening up to his guys, and they're arguing who is the greatest. They didn't have anybody to fact check them. Fact check them. Um, they were together most of the time, so they didn't need a fact checker. Um, they, they saw what each other had done, so what were, they, what, what were the stats that they were going by? What were they doing? Well, it could be maybe James said, I'm just speculating, but I didn't tell you guys, but I, I, I made fervent intercessory prayer at Jesus as every healing, and you didn't know that, so I'm the greatest. Now, I don't know. Um, Jesus, Peter said, well, I walked on the water. Yeah, I'm Peter, and you fell in too. Well, I also had the great revelation of Messiah, so I'm probably the great. I mean, you can hear the guys. What are they, what are they talking about? Well, and of course, Philip and Andrew could say, hey, listen, we brought a bunch of Greek guys to Jesus and evangelized them, and, and so we're the greatest. Um, and and someone can say, well, well, you guys were out getting dinner one time. Jesus healed this young man of a whooping cough, and I was there with him. I mean, could you imagine all the stories they were telling? Um, they sent him out two by two, if you remember. Jesus sent him out two by two. And while they were out, maybe they came back with stories that they did some great things. Man, I cast out 12 demons. Well, I cast out 50. Well, I cast out demons, and I, I saw healings. I mean, so what are they arguing about? Who's the greatest? And so that's what's going to set the, the pay, the, really the, 
the tone for why Jesus washed the disciples' feet. They're too busy arguing, how are you going to wash someone's feet while you think they're better than they are? And the Lord is going to set many precedent in, in, through this foot washing. Again, it is not an ordinance of the church. I'm not opposed to foot washing. I, I one time went to a meeting and they didn't tell me they were going to wash feet. And so I didn't know if my feet stunk or whatever, but it wasn't, I was really uncomfortable. And again, it's a, it's a lot of people, it's a real precious moment. I, I'm, I'm good with that. Um, but we don't, we don't necessarily wash feet here. Um, if you wash them at home, no, I'm just kidding. But if you feel like that's something you'd like to do, it's, it is an intimate. I see people cry at foot washing ceremonies. So, so some people, it's a really meaningful thing. So, yeah, you know. Um, but the only two ordinances that are given to the church, there's really three. But one is the Lord's Supper communion, in which tonight we're going to do. And let me just say this. I do not believe that it's an option to come to the Lord's table through communion. I believe God has commanded us to come together. I know a lot of churches do it on Sunday morning, and so that way everybody we can kill two birds with one stone. But we like to do it on Sunday night. We call it the Acts 242 meeting because what happens is we get to do communion, we get to pray, and then we get to allow the gifts to move. But I don't think it's necessary. I just hear me out on this. I don't think it's an option. We sometimes, well, I can come to Sunday night communion, or I don't really have to come. And guys, I'm just telling you, we may not be able to meet like this too much longer. Now, I don't know what's going to happen to our country. A lot of things are going on, and, uh, but uh, there is an outside possibility that we may endure some persecution. They may want to shut things down. I'm just saying, let's meet every time we can. Let's come together, guys, tonight and take the Lord's Supper. Let's come together and love on one another. Let the gifts flow. Allow God to move. I mean, it's it. I don't. And again, I don't know if I think that's an option or not. I almost think it. So that's one of the ordinances that God gives. And the other one is baptism. It's, and the other one is um, coming to church. Hebrews 10, 24, 25. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, but encouraging each other and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So I believe that's in one. If it's if Jesus did it in the Gospels. And it's taught and it's practiced in the book of Acts and it's taught in the epistles by Paul or some of the writers. There's a threefold witness. So there's how you derive church ordinances. And that's baptism, that's um, um, communion, and that's um, church, okay? It's faith, church, and, and fellowship. So now Jesus is now facing the last night of his life on this planet as far as in the flesh. Now, when we are facing, and you know, I've been in a lot of places where I've had to talk with people that are facing death, um, whether it's in the hospital or wherever it may be, and I, I've talked to a lot of people. And what happens is when we are facing death, there are some things we want to happen at that time. Like what? We want our family to be around and we want to be able to say to them what we know we won't be able to say that to them in the next life. We want to say everything we possibly can. And I believe Jesus now is taking that opportunity in this upper room discourse to tell us his heart, to tell his 12 guys, hey, listen, this is it. You know, this is crunch time. I am going to die. And I want you guys to know these things. I like the, the movie, Remember the Titans, and there was one particular uh, part of the the movie that I really enjoyed and it was the night they were playing in a championship and the defensive coach came up to the guys and he and he was giving them a, a last like his talk about you know playing defense but he goes you guys I want you to blitz and blitz all night long and I do not want them to cross the line of scrimmage because I want them to remember the night they played the Titans yeah I mean, that, those guys went out and started knocking heads in the movie. So, But Jesus is one to inspire his, um, his men. He wants to show them how much he loves them. He's going to show them the full extent of, the, of his love. Um, so the, the atmosphere, this is the atmosphere Jesus is producing, I believe, in chapters 13 through 17. He's telling them his heart. He's telling them really important things. Um, and what... To me, 
part of what foot washing is, is serving in humility. It's, not, it's easier for me to wash your feet maybe once a month than for me to die to myself and sacrifice and serve you as a brother. So I can wash your feet and say, I washed your feet. You know, well, I need some help moving my house into this other house. Well, you know, let's just do the foot washing thing. It's, it's hard to die to ourself, and it's easier to, and again, I'm not downing and dogging foot washing. I'm just saying. Just saying. So there's two events that are going to happen before he really gets into this heavy teaching. And one is the Lord's Supper, and it gives a lot more room for the Lord's Supper in Luke and Mark. You can read those, and there's more room uh, for, for explaining what happened. And then the argument went on. But I just want to give you an idea of what we're looking at for the next probably five, six, seven weeks. Um, he's setting the stage for these topics, guys. He's going to predict his betrayal in um, verse 21 through 30. He's going to give them a new command in chapter um, um, 13, verse 34, to love one another. Now, we know that in Deuteronomy and Leviticus, we know that that's part of the law, that we are to love one another, right? So is that a new law? Is that a new commandment? The new, he stamps it with a new, fresh touch to it. As I have loved you. And they cannot do that until Jesus dies on the cross and realize that that's why the type of love that we got to love each other. We need to love each other with that kind of love to lay down our life for you. I like Gail Irwin says, um, I can't remember what his um, saying was. I got it. Oh, a servant, one who makes life better for another person. That's what a servant is. I can tell you here at Harvest Chapel, I believe that we have a lot of servants. My wife makes my life really nice. I love, and my son-in-law, my daughter, and my granddaughters, my grandkids, especially the ones that are here in the ministry. You guys make it, you serve, and you make, make things a little bit easier for me as a pastor. But we have people that work. This is, a, this is a body that works from the body. We don't have a lot of people on staff. And the reason being, you guys are doing the work of the ministry. I mean, we're in somewhat of an unusual church. Really, we're probably more, maybe like, hopefully like the first church. But we don't have staff for everything and everybody. But you guys just fill in. And I know that you're servants. And we have a church full of servants. And we want to thank you, my wife and I, for the blessing that we get every week, every week, every year that you guys give us the gift. We are so thankful. The card, just everything that comes along with it, we are, we are humbled Every time that we get to be your pastor and then get recognized out doing it, hey, guys, it doesn't get any better than this. We, we love you guys, and we thank you for your love for us. We are called to Harvest Chapel, and I'll probably die in this podium. Now, I'm not saying I'm going to die soon, but, but I don't think it, I don't know about retirement. I just can't see it. Anyway, I went way off on that. Um, he predicts, in these next chapters, he predicts his denial. He shares about our future home in my father's house and our many mansions. He teaches us about the de his deity or his oneness with the Father in chapter 14. He gives us the role of the Holy Spirit in chapter 14. He teaches about the vine and the branches in chapter 15. He teaches us about a relationship to each other in chapter 15. He teaches us about a relationship with the world in chapter 15. He teaches us about the promise of the Holy Spirit, chapter 16. And he says in that, it's good that I go away. The night he's leaving, he's saying, it's good that I go away. And they're all still kind of going, what really is happening right now? He's just predicted his death. He predicts, and he goes now in 16 to predict his death and his resurrection. And then he gives this awesome prayer, is what we call the Lord's Prayer. A lot of people think the Lord's Prayer is our Father which art in heaven. And that's a, that's a great prayer. It's a cool prayer. But the Lord's Prayer is in, in John chapter 17. It's the high priestly prayer that he prays for all of his disciples then and now. He prayed for us, and we reaped the benefits of the John chapter 17, high priestly prayer by Jesus. We're here because of that prayer, because of that magnificent prayer, that, and we're going to be looking into this in the next few weeks. 
And so, but when he predicts his, um, um, when he predi- predicts um, his betrayal, if you remember in Matthew 26, 25, um, what does Judas say when he predicts it? Surely it's not I, Rabbi. And what's the Lord say? You said it. Now, he probably didn't say it like that. But he did say, you said it yourself. You indicted yourself right there. It's not I. And then in Luke 22, 23, they begin to discuss with each other. So that, that night had a lot of things in it, a lot of things happening. They were talking about how great they are. And so let's begin with verse 1. That was all an intro. He's probably going, he's going to get to the passage. Now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he should depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them unto the end. Now, some of your translations will say he showed the full extent of his love. I like that translation, but he loved them until the end. The end of what? The end of his life. But he showed them the full extent of his love, and that could not have been realized until he died on the cross. They couldn't, and, and, and it couldn't be realized about Judas's plight that he loved Judas, I believe, up until the very moment he gave him the morsel, I believe Judas had a chance to repent. Of course, he, J- Jesus, living outside time, knew that the son of perdition wouldn't repent, but, he, but I believe he had chances to repent. I believe that it was because of Judas's free will he became an apostle. Jesus asked him, and he said, yes, so it was his will, and he, by his free will, he was a traitor. And God cannot take our will from us. So he showed him the full extent of his love, and during supper, the devil, having already put it in the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and he had come forth from God and was going back to God. So he knew, I mean, he knew where he was going. For the joy set before him, it says in Philippians, that he endured the cross. It's kind of like he knew from that moment on that Judas, when he walked out, it's kind of like you ever watch a football game and it's like 50 to 2. And it's like you got five seconds to go. So they, they just hike the ball and they stand there. It's a done deal, but they have to wait the five seconds to win the game. The game's won. I mean, I know Jesus is looking at suffering, but he knows the game is won. And he knows he's going, he knows he's going back to the Father. Could you imagine how joyful? I mean, I remember going to Bible college and coming home for the first time. And Terry and I, and we had Jeremy in April. It was, we looked forward at Christmas time, that first time, to come home and be with our family. I was so excited about that. Or if I'm gone at any length of time away from Terry and Josh, I really look forward to coming home. I look forward to seeing my wife. I like coming home to my wife. I like being with her. And if I'm gone at any length of time, I love coming back. It's just, and you know what? We're old, but it never, but. The love of Christ and my love for my wife has not grown cold. She does everything possible to make a man stay at home by her cooking and her love. And her, and, G, and, the God, and Jesus is looking forward to going back to the Father and being embraced in his love. He's looking forward to that. I know he's, he's troubled in spirit, and I think he's more troubled because of two things. Because he's troubled that Judas is going to follow through in his betrayal, and he's troubled because he's got to go to Gethsemane, and when he goes to Gethsemane, he knows that he's going to go to the cross, and the Father will not look at him when he takes the sin of the world upon him. I know the pain he didn't look forward to, the, the lashing, but two things I believe that, 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 that Jesus looked at, and, and, and I can't say he was troubled because of anything else, but maybe Judas falling away from him, and the Father turning his back on him during that time where he took the sins of the world upon him. So he rose from the supper and laid aside his garments and taking, um, and notice what he does here. The first thing he does, he, he, and he's making a statement here. The guys have been arguing. Who's the greatest? You got to remember in that culture that they would walk around in sandals and then the, their feet would get like dirty and muddy and whatever. 
And, they're, and when they eat, they eat at a table called a triclinium. And it's got one table in front, and then it's got two that come off to the side. And what they do, they don't have chairs. It's about like a coffee table. And they lean on their, um, um, their left shoulder because they eat with their right. And they lean on their left shoulder, and they, they dip the sop and whatever. And, uh, and so here he was during that time instituting the Lord's Supper. Guess who was at his right-hand side? John. And guess who was on his left-hand side? Judas. Those, those were places, both places of honor. This is what probably Jesus said. I don't know. He, the master of ceremonies always picked where people were going to sit. And I'm, said, I'm sure he said, John, I want you on my right. Judas, I want you on my left side. I believe giving him once again the opportunity to experience the loving kindness of Jesus and, it, and offering up to him, hey, if you want to repent, you still can. You still can do it. He is giving him choices, clear up to the, again to the morsel. But he said he rose from the supper table. So he got up, number one, and he laid aside his garments, number two, and he took a towel. And what happens when you take your um, garment off, you have like this little tunic that looks like a long T-shirt. And he took a towel and he girded himself. And that was the, um, that was the garb of a, a bond servant, the lowest servant in the house. That's what they would do. And they're all looking at him going, and, and you know, they all had nasty feet, old nappy feet and croto toes or whatever. <laughs> they had some nasty feet and he's going to wash them. They should have been washed to begin with, but they were arguing. So he makes a statement here of who's the greatest. He tells them who's the greatest. Then he poured water into a basin, the water being like the word of God, and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel and <clears throat> with which he was girded. And so notice that he, he wiped them with the towel. It's interesting because he finished the job. And so he came to Simon Peter and he said to him, now this is interesting. He came to Simon Peter and, you know, Simon is always trying to, you know, tell the Lord how to do ministry. And he's, he tries to stop, stop Jesus' um, endeavors. But um, so he came to Simon Peter and he, um, I'm sorry. Yeah, verse 6. And so he came to Simon Peter and he said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Now, an, an, a commentator by the name of Trapp said, this is an immoderate modesty or a proud humility. Lord, you're going to wash my feet? Oh, no way. You're God. You're Lord. He's acting all humble, acting all, you know what I mean? And, and it, it was sort of a, a taking pride in his humility. Lord, you're not going to wash my feet. And here's Jesus, the Lord of all heaven and earth, trying to implement something, and Peter's trying to tell him what to do. No, you're going to go wash my feet. Oh. And Jesus answered and said to him, what I do, you do not realize, but you shall understand hereafter. And the reason he said that is because he had to die on the cross, and, they, and then Judas had to be exposed as a traitor to make that meaningful point where Jesus bowed down at Judas' feet, actually bowed it at the feet of the traitor, the number one menace, his arch enemy outside Satan, being Judas. He bowed and he washed his feet. And to me, that it was a striking point that tells me that no matter how much I've been hurt or how much I've been, been offended, guys, we are to wash people's feet and love them unconditionally. No matter what. And, and, and here, he said, you won't understand right now, guys, but when I die and you see Judas being exposed as the traitor, you'll understand how much the great love is that I have for you guys and how great a love I have for even Judas. And no matter what you've done here this morning, it, it makes no difference. He loves you, and he wants to forgive you. And I don't know, or, and, and also, if someone has hurt you terribly, I mean, this is tearing Jesus up, knowing that Judas is going to die and, and burn forever in hell. You don't spend three and a half years with someone, even that he's a traitor, and don't love him, and, and, and love his soul anyway. 
You just don't. And this is what God's telling us. When we're with people, we're to love them unconditionally and forgive them. We're to wash their feet. We're to wash the feet of the people that maybe don't like us. Verse 8, Peter said to him, Never shall you wash my feet. Now, we're going to stop there for a moment. Okay, apparently in the Greek, and I'm not a Greek scholar, but I get this from Skip Isaac, that it's a double negative, meaning this, never, never shall you wash my feet. I mean, he not only told Jesus, hey, you're going to wash my feet, you're never going to wash my feet. Telling Jesus, I mean, could you imagine telling the, I don't know if he said Lord, it'd be kind of an oxymoron, you can't wash my feet, Lord, Kurios. You're going to to wash my feet? Never, never. He's being obstinate here. Guys, we're just like Peter. We're no different from Peter. We like to run things, don't we? We like to make things happen our way a lot of times. No, no. You know, you're not going to wash my feet. Never shall you wash my feet. Never. In fact, in in the Greeks, never, never. And Jesus, Jesus answered him. If I don't wash you, you have no part in me. Now, you got to remember, all the guys are watching all this happen. They've not washed each other's feet. They should have done. Someone should have jumped up and did it or done it or whatever. And not only that, they're watching this exchange between Peter. And, and Peter, I think Peter was somewhat sincere in what he was saying, like, no, I don't want. But at the same time, he was sincerely wrong in his approach. Then Simon Peter said, Lord, not my feet only, but also my head, hands and head. In other words, okay, well, if that's the case, why don't you just wash me all over? And he's trying to tell the Lord again what to do at this foot washing ceremony. And, 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 you know, it looks so innocent. But again, guys, we try so often to tell the Lord, Lord, you probably ought to do it this way, or you probably ought to do it that way. Often, you know, I remember having some car problems, and and um, I, I started, we lived pretty close to the place we were meeting at the boys' club, so I had to ride a bike over to the boys' club to teach on Sunday because our car got wrecked. And I felt like the Lord said, don't buy a car, I'll give you one. I'll give you one. So I drove a bike over to the sermon. I carry my guitar sometimes. And um, and it wasn't happening. I'm going, Lord, Lord, I know you want to give us a car, so I'm going to go out and buy one. And I'm going to buy it on time. And, you know, I know you want me. If you're not going to do it, I'll do it. That basically, that's what I was saying to him. And I believe the Lord chided me, said, I don't want you buying a car. I'll give you a car. I'll let make sure you get a car. And so God has done that so graciously. Now, some of the cars we got weren't the greatest shape, but they were given to us at times. But I want to get things done. Peter's a get her done guy. Just like, let's just get her done. And guys, we have to wait on him and allow him to wash our feet while he's ministering to us, while we're trying to get her done. You need to rest. Allow him to wash your feet. Jesus said to him, He who has bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. You are clean, but not all of you. For he knew the one who was betraying him. For this reason he said, Not all of you are clean. Let's go back to Tim. He said to him, He who has bathed needs uh, needs only to wash his feet. Now, basically, the word bathed there is a word luo, L-O-U-O in the Greek, and it means complete. He's actually speaking of the cross. Peter made the profession that Jesus was Messiah, so he was saved. The, the culmination of that salvation was when he died on the cross and rose again. But So he said, Peter, you're saved. You're bathed. You just need to wash your feet. It's okay. And, you know, here's the interesting thing, guys. When you give your life to Jesus, you're saved. It's not like you can get unsaved. I mean, you can walk away, but he's saying, you you know, and he's giving Peter some assurance about his salvation. You're bathed, buddy, but you just need to wash your feet. Now, in those, in back in the priestly times, the, the priest of God, 
they would, before they went into duty, they would have to wash their body completely, okay? And then they would, then they would offer sacrifices. And then when they offer a sacrifice, they, they'd go in and they just wash their hands and their feet at the brazen laver. But they wouldn't have to wash their whole body. They just washed their... And here's the idea. We walk through this tainted world. I mean, you could be, you know, watching TV and you're not expecting and then this really loosely clad person dressed really prerogative comes right in front of you and you just go, oh man, you feel violated. I mean, you ever done that? Just like, what in the world? did? Where did that come from? I'm watching a cartoon or something. Or you just drive around and you see the things in this world and you get contaminated. And we need that 1 John 1, 9, the, the Christian bar of soap. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. We just got to, we got, we got to just ask him and that's what he's talking about, to wash your feet. You walk in a nasty world. Our world is polluted, and guys, it rubs off on, on us, doesn't it? And, it's, and so we have to have our feet washed. And this is what he's telling Peter. You know, you're clean, but then he says, but not all of you. He's going to talk about Judas. I just want to talk about Judas' feet. Sounds funny. What did it take to me to gather up the humility and fortitude to disrobe himself, put a towel around and pour, pour water in a basin, and then bow at the feet of Judas and wash his feet and then wash the feet of a betrayer? What did that take, guys? Well, that would take a God and a supernatural work of God, and he is God. Again, let me go back. Three and a half years he spent with, with Jude, um, Judas. And he loved him. And he probably grew fond of him in some areas. And he, he didn't walk around. I don't think Jesus walked around with the scowl going, yeah, here he is, that Judas. I hate that guy. I, he's, I got a grudge against him, and I don't even want to talk to him. Or Hi, hi Judas. I believe he loved him. And, to the, and, and he showed, and this is what he meant. He showed, he had shown the full extent of his love to Judas. And I believe that, that word comes more and more true when Jesus died on the cross. But when he washed his feet and died on the cross, I can't imagine. He had to bow down before his number one menace, his arch enemy outside Satan being number one was Judas. Judas was a wicked man and he, all he thought about was, was the money and power and tried to betray Jesus so that he could maybe get a place of power in the new messianic um, um, political realm. And I think, was it just a ritual that Jesus went through just to prove to his disciples that, you know, I, I'll love Judas. I want you guys to see how, what I do. Or was it a sincere act of forgiveness laced with grace and mercy? And I think you know the answer to that. Jesus didn't just go through the motions with Judas to say, well, I'll just do this because it looks good and I want the guys to know that they need to forgive. I believe he did that with the most sincere heart. Washed the feet of a man that was going to have him killed in just hours. Was there a feeling of begrudging toward this demon-possessed man? No. No. What Jesus is saying at that moment to Judas, I believe, washing his feet. He says, I'm showing you, Judas, the full extent of my love. I'm serving you until my death, and I'll die for you if you just accept it. Guys, this is what he's telling us this morning. I've died for you, but you have to accept it. You have to allow me into your heart, and I need to be your Lord and not just have remorse that you got caught, but repent from your sins. That's the big difference between Judas and, and Peter. Peter repented of his denial. Judas had remorse. Remorse does not constitute repentance. A lot of people get caught. A lot of people will come to this altar, 
and they'll confess Christ as Lord, and they have a lot of remorse. And, you know, we're such an instant satis gratification society. I just need some release from my guilt and my sin. Well, go up the altar, man, and Jesus will forgive you. No, guys, it's not just coming up the altar and getting forgiveness and, uh, and releasing your remorse. It's a repentance that we need to see. And I'm sure a lot of people come up with just being remorseful. And I, I, I sometimes wonder, I mean, I, we give altar calls here, and I'll always do that, but we don't want to cheapen it. We say, hey, you just come forward, everything's going to be fine because you accept Jesus and your sins are forgiven. That's all true. But Judas just wanted it relief from his remorse. In fact, when he heard that they delivered Jesus up to Pontius Pilate, it freaked him out. And he went into the high priest and threw 30 pieces of silver at their feet and went out and hung himself. He lost all hope. He did not repent. How can I forgive the person who hurt me so deeply that I feel like I can't recover? To divorce or maybe murder victim maybe you've been burglarized or you've been battered or you've been in a marriage where there's been infidelity and unfaithfulness betrayal is the deepest of all human hurts and especially in the area of faithfulness with the husband and wife it's a very deep deep hurt and betrayal and, and jesus experienced the ultimate betrayal now i know it hurts if you've been in a divorce but I can tell you this, Jesus has been there and he had victory over it and he washed the feet of the one that betrayed him. It's a hard, near impossible thing to do. Judas' betrayal was one of the ultimate in human history, is the ultimate of, of, of all in, his, in human history. But let me just share with you this. No one's beyond redemption. No one. So when Jesus took up his guard, then it says in verse 12, and, when, and so when he had washed their feet and taken his garments, he reclined at the table again and said to them, do you know what I have done? And again, notice what he did. He took up his garments. It's the same Greek word in Lambano that's in John chapter 10, verses 17 through 18. Meaning this, that Jesus said, I give my life away. No one takes it from me, and I will take it up again and pick it up again. So what this is symbolic of, as he took his garments and put them back on, that he was going to die, and they were going to take his garments off. And he was going to be near naked on a cross, but he's going to put his garments back on. He's going to sit as the King of kings and Lord of lords with a sash dipped in blood. King of kings and Lord of lords. Anybody looking forward to seeing that? Seeing the victory that we will have, guys, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. So he asked them, do you know what I've done? And he shared with them. Verse 15, we bump down there, really call it, or verse 13. You call me teacher and Lord, and you do what do right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord, um, the Lord and the teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Again, he's not instituting foot washing. He's saying, guys, that no matter what, you forgive and you walk in humility. Love is the soul of humility and humility is the soul of love i i had some i had some uh, sayings i wrote here from john macarthur and um i don't think i don't know if i am yeah i i love some of these things about love i know this he and it is to be true your capacity to love is in direct proportion to your capacity to humble yourself humility is the soul of love the humbler you are, the less interested you are in yourself and the greater capacity to invest yourself in someone else. The lower you go in, in your self-concern, the higher you go in concern for others. Anybody say amen? Those things really resonate with me. 
When I got my eyes on myself, I can't serve. And I don't even care if I serve. Because it's all about me. I have a pity party. And then, you know, that's the world's smallest fiddle. Play my heart bleeds for you. And, and that ought not to be. We need, and I, I, I love that what he says that, that humility is the soul of love. You can't love unless you're humble. And you can't be humble unless God humbles you in his, in his sight. He said in verse 15, I give you example that you should do as I I do as I did to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master. Neither is the one who sent, who is sent greater than the one who sent him. And basically, he's saying that, he, that God the Father is even greater than Jesus, and yet they're both God. But guys, we are not greater than our master. And I know you, well, well I, duh, I know that. But think about it. We act like we are, like Peter. Oh, you're not going to wash my feet, Lord. God forbid that isn't going to happen. God forbid, you know, Peter does that so many times. You remember when uh, Jesus told him in Matthew, hey, listen, I'm going to go and suffer at the hands of the chief priest. I'm going to die, but I'm going to raise again on the third day. Peter says, God forbid, we're not going to let that happen on our watch. This is kind of like me paraphrasing. That's not going to happen. Our... And the Lord is going, what did the Lord respond to him? I mean, he said he's going to raise on the third day. That would pique my interest. But they shut down the moment he said he's going to suffer. They didn't want to hear anything else. And you know what, know what he said to Peter? That, Lord, we're not going to let you do that. He said, get behind me, Satan. That would be the ultimate in shame. And I don't think Jesus is trying to shame Peter as much as he's saying, hey, listen, that's the enemy speaking through you, buddy. The Lord rebuke you, Satan. He didn't say, Lord, rebuke you, Peter. But that would make me feel kind of awkward. Like, whoa, that's awkward. I just got rebuked by God, and I got called Satan. Peter tried to do it so often in the Mount Transfiguration. Remember, he said, hey, uh, Lord, it's good for us to be here. There's Moses and Elijah and you, and it's good for us to be here. In fact, he said, it's good for me to be here, because we'll just make you three tabernacles. And that wasn't what the Lord was trying to ask. He wanted to make three tabernacles so they can just hang out there in the glory and bask in the glory of Elijah and Moses and Jesus. And the Lord didn't want him hanging out on the mountain. But Peter's saying, hey, we'll just make you three tabernacles. Oh, and by the way, that guy that tries, is going to try to take you in the garden, I'm going to take his head off. And he, he didn't take his head off. He just took his ear off. Not a very good swordsman. Peter likes to do things his own way. Yet, the Lord loved Peter, and he was he was the head of the church, and he and James there in Jerusalem. It's got hope for you guys, for me. It gives us hope. And he denied him three times. He did not betray Jesus. He just lost his courage, and the Lord knew that. And often we lose our courage, and we don't serve the Lord like we should. And we're convicted. And all he's asking is that you just come back. Allow him to wash your feet. He just wants to wash your feet. That's all. When do you give up on someone? Came to my mind when I was putting this message together. I mean, I got I so many notes. I, so many thoughts came through my mind. And I, and I had to decipher. But when do you say enough's enough when you don't throw your pearls before a swine? And uh, as we go on with the story, verse 17, if you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. I do not speak to you, all of you. I know the ones I've chosen, but as the scripture will be, may be fulfilled, he who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. And just by way, of just going back to that verse real quick, keep the thought, how do you know when to give up on someone or if you should? That, that is quote out of Psalm 41.9. It's a real forceful statement in the Hebrew. It, it could say it like this, made his heel great against me. The idea of bringing about a great fall or taking terrible advantage of someone. That's what that means. He has raised, lifted up. This is a terror in, in the Hebrew, that's a very strong statement about what Judas has done. 
For, I'm on, for now on I'm telling you before it comes to pass so that when it occurs you may believe that I am. Now the word he is in italics. I think you can just say I am Jesus claiming to be God here again. Truly, truly I say to you, he who receives, um, who receives whoever I send receives me and he who receives me receives him who sent me. Again, hold that thought about when you give up because I get to it. But um, I do have to address this. Where you're at in your walk, do you have somebody that you're accountable to? Like, okay, people come to church and they're naturally, hopefully submitted to the pastor or the pastor's vision. I mean, submitted in love. We work together. And or Bible study leaders or mentors or people that disciple us. When God sends someone your way and you reject that, there's one or two things. You're in the wrong spot and you need to move out or the person that's over you is in sin. But God puts people over us to love us. And I pray that you are under some body other than just the church here at Harvest. I'm great to have you here, but, but who is your Paul and who is your Timothy? God has sent people to mentor people and we need to accept the people that God has put in our lives and and, and I, I want to share that again who's your Paul who's your Timothy who's the one that God has sent to you to help really like he did with Lazarus unwrap him y'all we all need unwrapped I come unraveled by myself half the time not <clears throat> and, and mistakenly but but we all, we all need, and he said, man, whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. And if I send these apostles out and these disciples, they're sent by me. So are you settled up in your whole idea of leadership and people that you're submitting to? I think it's important. I think you probably just need to pray about it and look into it and ask the Lord what he's telling you, if anything. So the disciples started looking at it, one another at a loss to know which one he was speaking. And I, I don't know why, but they were together three and a half years and they're looking at each other and going, James? Well, is it me? Is it me, Peter? Is it, is it Thaddeus? Who is it? These guys are looking at each other and themselves. Is it I? I mean, if you walk with the Lord three and a half years with Jesus and they were doubting their call. I just want to let that be an encouragement. There are times when we just doubt, Lord, am I called? I, I, every once in a while I go through a stint of insanity and I tell Terry, I don't know if I'm still called. Am I, am I still called? Should I still stay in the pulpit? Am I just staying because I'm stubborn? And I, I believe that God wants you to know that you are called and he loves you. And as these guys are looking around, they're going, who, who? and I think this is a time of transformation in their life. They be, when Jesus rose from the grave, they went, oh, it wasn't me. It was, oh boy, Judas. It wasn't me. God's going to reassure you today or sometime in the near future, it's not, you're okay. But you have to repent from your sins and not walk in remorse. And that's where we see the difference between Judas and Peter. So verse 23, and they were reclining at Jesus' breast. One of his disciples who loved Jesus loved. And that, John never said, hey, I'm John, or I wrote the book, or he always said, the disciple Jesus loved. And some people think that's arrogant, like, well, he doesn't love Peter, he doesn't love James. No, the one he loved. That's you and me. Tom Camp is the disciple. I just going to say, who are you? I'm the disciple that Jesus loved. God believe that. You don't need to know my name, although I have one. Simon Peter therefore gestured to John. John being on the right side of Jesus. They're leaning on their left elbow. Peter may be down the table a little bit. And he gestured and he went, tss, tss, hey, hey, John. Tell, tell us who it is who he's speaking. So he's kind of inferring, John, would you just ask Jesus? And leaning back on Jesus, and, he, and notice that he was, he leaning back, 
thus on Jesus' breast, said to him, Lord, who is it? Get the picture of how close John is to Jesus. That is an intimate picture of Jesus loving his disciples. John's not gay at all. This is not a moment, anything like that. This is a moment in time where John loved Jesus so much and trusted him. He put his, he was listening right to the heart of Jesus. And he said, who is it? Who is it? Jesus therefore answered, that is the one whom I shall dip the morsel and give it to him. So when he had dipped the morsel, he took and gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. I believe this is the point where he knows that, because right after this, what does it say? Satan enters Satan enters Judas. He dipped the morsel in the sop, handed it back over his shoulder, and looked at Judas. And Judas took it. And I believe Jesus was saying, here, one more chance. And, 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 but when he took the sop, Satan entered him, and he took off. And Jesus, at that point, couldn't do anything because Satan sealed the deal. With Pharaoh, if you remember Pharaoh, Pharaoh hardened his heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart time and time again. And then it finally was God hardened Pharaoh's heart. That's called just, justice. Because God can't, and in fact in Romans it says God handed them over to a reprobate mind. There's a time where God says, I'm done. In fact, it says in Genesis, I, I cease striving with man. There was a time where he just ceases striving with us. He's given everybody the chance. We don't know that. We have no idea when that happens. But I believe there is a point in time in people's life that God's dealt with you and dealt with you and dealt with you. And you continue to just not respond to the voice of the shepherd. You continue to live your own way and live in the sin you are. You know what? He will hand you over. Now, I don't want that to be scary, but then I do. That's scary, Carl. I have a friend named Carl, and we used to tease him. That scares me, Carl. That's scary. I don't want to be ha- ever handed over, and I don't even want to walk that line. God forbid. Verse 26, Jesus therefore answered, The one of whom I shall dip the morsel and give it to him, so that he dipped the morsel. You know what that dip morsel is equivalent to? A toast. You ever been at a wedding and they tap the the cup? Toast, toast from the bride or the bridegroom. That morsel was a toast to honor Judas. To give him one last chance. Verse 27, And after the morsel, Satan entered to him. Jesus then therefore said to him, "Why? What you do, do quickly. Full on demon possession. He didn't, his head didn't spin around or puke out green puke like it did in the exorcist. He was a full-on demon-possessed man. He had a mission, and his heart was hard, and I believe God gave him chance after chance after chance. How would Jesus, I mean, did, did Judas know that Jesus' death would end up in a crucifixion? Did he think that he was trying to... Um, Further, Jesus to be conqueror says, hey, listen, we'll force his hand to be a conqueror because I want to be in his regime regime and have money and power. I don't know what he thought, but I do know when they handed over Jesus to the high priests, at that point in time, Judas came in and threw the 30 pieces of silver, like I said. And I think he knew that Jesus was in trouble and he would be crucified. And he lost all hope and killed himself. That's what Satan wants to do. That's what suicide is. You've lost all hope, or at least a lot of cases. There was no turning back for this man at all. I believe Judas was salvageable until this point, and he crossed the line. So how do you know? We don't know. But there are people that I've worked with before and I've continued and I still do continue with a lot of people. We just extend grace to and we work with them. You guys do too. But when do you call it enough? 
there is a time where, uh, you know, you can't judge whether they're going to come to Christ or make that total surrender, but there is a time you let people go. You just say, this is enough. Enough is enough. Trizzle, trazzle, trazzle, trome. Time for this one to come home. And God will either call them home or allow them to die in their sin. Oh, man, that's scary stuff. Sorry, guys. But that's the truth. That's the truth. He said, what you do, do quickly. No one of these reclining at the table knew for what purpose he had said this to him. For some were supposing because Judas had the money box that Jesus was saying to him, buy the things which you have need of for the feast or else that he should give something to the poor. And so after receiving the morsel, he went out immediately and it was night. And I believe the writer here, John's put, it was night because there's always the contrast. Jesus says he is the light of the world. And from that point on, Judas walked in darkness. He never came out of that darkness. You guys, you're not there. You've not committed the unpardonable sin. And I'm sure most of you aren't. But if you're here wrestling with stuff like that, hey, Jesus wants to wash your feet. So what I see... Again, if you betrayed in your marriage and you cheated on your spouse or you betrayed your employer and lied about your productivity or patentive job, betrayed your employees or covered up the lies of pornography, the sin of pornography, you've covered them up. God wants to forgive you. There's no betrayal that he can't forgive. Your forgiveness is possibly just minutes away we're going to close you can receive complete cleansing from your betrayal whatever that would be your failure failure and whatever you may feel like you can't be redeemed i mean not to minimize the deep betrayal of judas we all have in one way or another betrayed our maker and people around us haven't we yes we have and our sin does affect the people around us yes it does Staying true to the call and the position we've been granted in Jesus Christ is an everyday, moment-by-moment surrender in which we all struggle with, sometimes more intense than others. Jesus did four or five things I see here, and we'll close. And I know it's late, but I don't know what else to say. <laughs> you got to finish it out. Kids are... And it's really, I'll just finish it out very quick, a few minutes. First thing we see, Jesus rose from the table. Jesus came voluntarily to the planet Earth to be our Savior. He rose from the table, making the first move in a tense argument and environment. He made the first move to settle the guys down, doing what was right at the cost of laying down his pride in which Jesus had no pride. Somebody's got to do it, and this is the wrong attitude. Somebody's got to do it, and it might as well be me. I mean, Jesus didn't take that. Well, nobody else is washing the guy's feet. I guess I will. No, I have a lot of things to teach these guys by me washing their feet. And I have had that attitude in ministry, and I have to confess, and I've had to repent. Well, nobody else is going to do it. I guess I'll do it. Why isn't anybody else doing any work around here? <laughs> That's my, my insanity. Ah, somebody's got to do it. And I've learned that if I do it, I get stressed. But if I let the Lord do it, it's not, it's not stressful. A real leader sets the example in humility. Do what Jesus would do. As a leader through humility, this, this is what I mean, that, that the soul of love is humility. And that's what Jesus did. He rose from the table. If you're in your marriage and you've had an argument, guess who's got to rise from the table? First one who breaks the silence is the humble one who can, who can love out of unselfishness. It's either by saying, let's talk or I'm wrong, but somebody's got to make that first move, and you guys know what I'm talking about if you've been married. It's not my fault. It's her fault. It's not... My fault is his fault. 
If you just admit it, guys, sometimes we just need to suck it up and make it happen and get up from the table. Be humble. Then he laid aside his garment, Philippians 2.7. He emptied himself and humbled himself as a bondservant, Philippians 2.7 and 8. Jesus would be stripped of his garments right there at the cross. He stripped himself there washing those guys' feet. He laid aside whatever pride which he didn't have any or stubbornness and selfishness. That's us. He laid aside his garment and he took the place of a bondservant. Mark 10, 20, 10, 45. For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. Ephesians tells us to lay aside our old self. Ephesians 4, 22. Colossians 3, 9. Lay aside your old self. Peter 5, 5 says, be clothed with humility. Gird your loins with the truth. 1 Peter 3, 1, 3. Then he took a towel. I like this title, The King Who Led With a Towel. He took a towel and he began to wash their feet and then dry their feet. He poured water in a basin. The water is always symbolic of God's word. He was telling them, you need to wash each other in the word of the, wa- uh, the water of the word. In fact, Ephesians 5, 25 through 26, husbands love your wives and wa- as washing them with the water of the word. Gentlemen, you should wash your wife with the water of the word. You should set the pace in the scriptures at your home. You should be the one that, that sets that pace, gentlemen. And then the last thing he did is he wiped them with the towel. He finished the job. He didn't let the sun go down on his anger. We don't do that. But we finished the job. A lot of times when we mentor people, and I've mentored people, and we take them through experiencing God, or, you know, we've, taken, we've mentored a ton of people. I have. And, and finishing the job, meaning that who's the person that I mentored? Am I following up on him, or do we finish the, the process? Jesus finished the whole process. When you start something like a Bible study or a ministering to someone, and you, you don't follow through, you're not wiping them with the towel. You've got to follow through. It takes a commitment to give your life to someone. It's not just hunky-dory all the time, and we're serving just because we think it's like Jesus' cool thing to do. No, it's, it's we give our life in those areas. Who's your Paul and who's your Timothy? Who's the one that you're giving your life to? I don't think it's an option. I think it's a command. Go ye therefore into all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and making disciples of all nations. The humbler you are, the less interested you are in yourself. The greater your capacity to invest, and it's really the greater capacity to invest yourself in someone else. Get out of yourself. The lower you go in self-concern, the higher you go in concern for others. Jesus washed Judas' feet, the ultimate in forgiveness. And we are called to do the same. Let's finish with um, uh, with the song here, guys. We'll finish up. You can all stand. <clears throat>